yes, I have some show and tell today as well. I'll get to one of these rare books here uh, momentarily. Uh, it's probably good for everybody involved if I <clears throat> speak from a manuscript. Otherwise, I could be, we could be here well past uh, your next appointment. So uh, I've prepared a few remarks. And I also want to make sure we leave enough time uh, for questions on this very, very important subject. Today, I want to talk to you in terms of what Calvin means to me, but speak specifically to the issue of scriptural authority. Uh, it is my understanding that none of my predecessors have touched on this subject. Uh, but it is for Calvin and for those who claim a heritage in that tradition a very important issue. Uh, so let me, let me just begin. <clears throat> I was actually raised in a church that could be identified broadly as evangelical, at least in the 20th century sense of the term. First and foremost, the church insisted on a very high view of scriptural authority. In fact, I remember that most leaders in that congregation talked about Scripture as inerrant. Inerrant, a very important adjective uh, in that church. As a young person, I memorized huge portions of Scripture and came to regard this inerrant Bible as the only appropriate source for my theology, that is, how I thought about my faith, and the only important source for my piety, that is, how I lived out those faith commitments. I thought that I took Scripture seriously because I took it literally. But when I really began to study Scripture seriously, first in college and later in seminary, right here at CTS, I have to say I experienced something of a crisis in my faith. The faculty at Wabash College, especially Raymond Williams, who is now a trustee of CTS, introduced me to ways of thinking about Scripture and its authority without assuming its inerrancy. And then I came to CTS where the process continued and I was absolutely convinced that Jerry Jansen and Calvin Porter were out to destroy my faith by knocking out the only pillar on which it stood, namely an inerrant Bible. I argued and I resisted, unsuccessfully of course, because I thought that the only way to take scripture seriously was to take it literally. But it was my reading of John Calvin, and specifically his commentaries in Book One of his Institutes of the Christian Religion, that taught me a new way of thinking about Scripture and its authority. Though Calvin certainly assumed the inerrancy of the Bible, it was not a major theme of his theology. He did not judge Scripture to be authoritative because of its inerrancy. Instead, Calvin convinced me that Scripture is authoritative because of its ability to render a character for God, those are my words, especially as God is self-revealed in Jesus Christ to people who are faithful in their study of Scripture. In other words, Calvin taught me to understand the authority of Scripture in functional terms rather than in formal terms. It is, in fact, quite possible to take the Bible very seriously without taking it literally. Now, any discussion of Calvin's understanding of scriptural authority properly begins with the idea of accommodation. Calvin's dictum on this issue is well known and is best expressed in his commentary on the book of Ezekiel, of all places. He writes, in part, God cannot be comprehended by us except as far as God accommodates God's self to our standard. Between the infinite God and sinful humanity, there is a chasm which makes a knowledge of God in God's essence utterly impossible for us. And so humanity comprehends God only insofar as God chooses to reveal God's self to us and in the manner God chooses to do so. In all modes of God's self-revelation, God, quote, stoops far below God's loftiness, unquote, in such a way that humanity can best apprehend the knowledge of God by knowing God's qualities. And now this distinction be between a knowledge of God's essence and a knowledge of God's attributes or character lies at the heart of Calvin's notion of accommodation. The knowledge of God that Calvin famously refers to in the first lines of his institutes is an apprehensive apprehension of God's qualis deus sit, which is possible only because of God's self-revelation the way in which God acts in relationship to humanity. A knowledge of God quid deus set, that is, who God is in God's essence, is quite impossible for finite and sinful human beings. 
Furthermore, the knowledge of God is a subjective knowledge consisting more of an assurance of those qualities as belonging to God rather than a comprehension intellectually of what those qualities are. For example, we, know, we may know that God is merciful only by the way that God acts mercifully in relationship to us, even though we may not understand what it means fully to say that God is merciful. Do you see the distinction? It's much more of a subject, subjective knowledge of God based upon our experience with God. In a pointed criticism of the so-called anthropomorphites, Calvin applies his principle of accommodation specifically to scripture. And I think it's really helpful to look at this. Rejecting a common assumption of medieval theology, Calvin denies that God has body parts at all, even though scripture often speaks of God as having body parts, a face, his hands, his back, etc. Listen to what Calvin says. For who, even of slight intelligence, do not understand that as nurses commonly do with infants, God is wont in a measure to lisp in speaking to us. This, such forms of speaking do not much as express clearly what God is like as accommodate the knowledge of God to our slight capacity." Unquote. Scripture speaks to us in terms that we can understand. Thus, we should never presume too much about the knowledge of God as revealed in Scripture. God uses baby talk, as it were, in revealing God's self to humanity, even in Scripture. But this should not be understood as a devaluation of scriptural authority. Instead, finite humanity should rejoice in the fact that the infinite God has chosen to reveal God's self at all. Now perhaps the clearest statement of Calvin's position on scripture authority comes in book one of his institutes. He writes, for by a kind of mutual bond, the Lord has joined together the certainty of the Lord's word and of the Lord's spirit, so that the perfect religion of the word may abide in our minds when the spirit who causes us to contemplate God's face shines and that we may ter in turn embrace the spirit with no fear of being deceived when we recognize the spirit in the spirit's own image, namely the word. Now, here Calvin is responding at least in part to developments in Roman Catholic theology during the Council of Trent. In its fourth session in 1546, the council decreed that equal authority undergirds the written books of scripture and the unwritten traditions of the church. And so perhaps it is this decree in mind th that Calvin has in mind when he writes, but a most pernicious error widely prevails that scripture has only so much weight as is conceded to it by the assent of the church, as if the eternal, inviolable truth of God depending, depended upon the decision of humanity, exclamation point. And he also says, it is utterly vain then to pretend that the power of judging scripture so lies with the church that its certainty depends upon churchly consent, unquote. By insisting that the word and the Holy Spirit of God, the word, not the word and the church are in a reciprocal relationship, Calvin clearly locates the authority of scripture in God's self-revelation rather than in human judgments about that self-revelation. Now the internal logic of Calvin's systematic, it seems to me, demands this reciprocal relationship between word and spirit. He insists that a true knowledge of God must come at the divine initiative, but he also admits that scripture, though errorless, is nonetheless a divine accommodation to humanity. Moreover, Calvin must account for how this errorless Bible was first recorded and then transmitted by fallible, in fact sinful, human beings. To preserve the integrity of scripture then, Calvin must attribute its transmission, its preservation, and its application to divine activity through the Holy Spirit. Now it's worth noting here first and foremost that Calvin is seeking assurance that the knowledge of God revealed in Scripture is trustworthy. He believed that the alternative, false and misleading knowledge of God, abounded in his day, especially in the Roman Catholic Church and among those radical reformers and Anabaptists. One of Calvin's chief concerns in the Institutes is humanity's tendency to slip into idolatry if, a knowledge, if its knowledge of God is faulty or incomplete. 
Therefore, more than answering Tridentine theology or preserving the internal logic of his systematic, Calvin wants to locate the authority of scripture in its source, that is, in God. But I think because he is a pastor, Calvin appears less concerned with the formal authority of scripture than he does with its functional authority in the lives of faithful people. How does scripture function as an authority? Not what is the source of its authority. Calvin uses the metaphor of spectacles to describe this functional authority of scripture. Listen to what he says. Just as old or bleary eyed men and those with weak vision if you thrust before them a most beautiful volume, even if they recognize it to be some sort of writing, yet can scarcely construe two words, but with the aid of spectacles will begin to read distinctly. So scripture, gathering up the otherwise confused knowledge of God in our minds and having dispelled our dullness, clearly shows us the true God. Think about that metaphor for just a second. If you wear glasses, you understand this very well. You know, you take your glasses off, and if I did so, I could look out at this crowd. I'm going to assume that you're all people, right? But I don't know that for sure. I see lots of blurry blobs out there. <laughs> and so, you know, I can, rev I can understand something by what I'm seeing, by what I'm apprehending. But like spectacles, like a pair of eyeglasses, which by the way was new technology in Calvin's day, Scripture clarifies. Scripture pulls together all of our otherwise confused knowledge of God and gives us a clear and distinct apprehension of who God is, what God's character is, especially as God relates to humanity. Scripture has authority for the believing person because it provides the norm by which all other knowledge of God is to be judged. All knowledge from God and from the natural world, from the teachings of the church, even from the work of the Holy Spirit, all of this needs to be judged in, by Calvin's thought in terms of what knowledge of God in Scripture reveals. Because Calvin focuses more keenly on the functional than the formal authority of Scripture, he can treat the biblical text both reverently and critically at the same time. He can, for instance, doubt Pauline authorship of Hebrews. He can deny that Peter wrote 2 Peter, the epistle that bears his name. And he can do all of this without detracting from the Bible's functional authority. Calvin admitted difficulties harmonizing the number of women at the empty tomb, making sense of the chronology of Jesus' ministry, especially when you compare John to the synoptics. And knowing just how many of Jacob's descendants entered Egypt with him, was it 70 or was it 72? Right? He can, he can treat the text reverently and critically at the same time. Show and tell. What I have in my hand here is a, an English translation from the year 1610 of a work that uh, Calvin published in 1555 called Calvin's Harmony of the Evangelists. It's one of the earliest attempts by the Protestant reformers to do a kind of side-by-side -side analysis of the content of the synoptic gospels. And so it's a commentary on all three gospels sort of smashed together but the main theme in this commentary, again, this is the English translation of the Latin, the main theme here is trying to understand but not reconcile the differences between the Gospels. He's willing to say, you know what? They just have different ways of describing the same thing. Now, that is a very interesting way of looking at the Bible, especially in the 16th century. So he can uh, treat the text both uh, reverently and critically all at the same time. Now Calvin maintains this dialectical quality of scriptural authority between formal and functional poles by introducing the divine agency of the Holy Spirit. Now I've suggested already the reciprocal relationship between word and spirit is key to understanding scriptural authority in Calvin and he states his position frankly in book one of the Institutes. Listen again to what he says. The testimony of the Spirit is more excellent than all reason. Did you catch that? The testimony of Scripture, of the Spirit, 
is more excellent than all reason. For as God alone is a fit witness of God's self in the word, so also the word will not find acceptance in a person's heart before it is sealed with the inward testimony of the Spirit. The same spirit, then, who has spoken through the mouths of the prophets must penetrate our hearts to persuade us that they faithfully proclaim what has been divinely commanded. Without the inward testimony of the spirit, Scripture has no authority whatsoever. The same spirit who inspired the authors of Scripture enters the hearts of believers to persuade them of Scripture's functional authority. To the believer enlightened by the Holy Spirit, Timothy George writes, there is a direct correlation between the moments of inspiration in Scripture and illumination in the minds of the believer. Now, though Calvin was well acquainted with all manner of proofs for the authenticity and authority of Scripture, Calvin still states unequivocally that, quote, those who wish to prove to unbelievers that Scripture is the Word of God, they are acting foolishly, for only by faith can this be known, unquote. Now, I agree with my mentor, William Plaker, who wrote long ago that modern theology has gone terribly wrong at precisely this point. The Protestant scholastics of the 17th and 18th century placed too much emphasis on the capacity of human reason to apprehend God, to take the facts of Scripture, as they called them, and to organize them into an argument in favor of this or that attribute of God. The Princeton theologians of the late 19th century, in their response to developing higher critical study of the Bible, insist on the doctrine of plenary inspiration as a presupposition that undergirds Scripture and gives it its authority. 20th century fundamentalists and even some evangelicals fall into the same alluring trap. The end result, it seems, is the faulty assumption that taking the Bible literally is the only way to take it seriously. So more than nothing else, my study of Calvin has freed me of that presupposition. Thank God. Like Calvin, my understanding of scriptural authority is grounded in the idea that an infinite and mysterious God far beyond my limited limited abilities to comprehend has by an act of grace revealed God's self to me in ways that I can understand. By virtue of the inward testimony of the Holy Spirit, I can apprehend with clarity what God's character is, especially in God's relationship to humanity. I can trust that The Bible faithfully communicates to me, especially in the life and ministry, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I can trust that the Bible will instruct me in the ways of true piety, faillessly. In other words, for me and for Calvin, the authority of Scripture is grounded in God and not in any argument based on human reason. Now, just before I came down for this conversation, I pulled out the credo that I wrote for systematic theology while I was a student here at CTS. That's where I read Calvin for the first time, and that's where I found some clarity on these matters. And I still agree, in fact, with what I wrote more than 15 years ago. Accompanied by the inward testimony of the Holy Spirit, the Bible becomes for the believer an authoritative, trustworthy, and indispensable witness to God's self-revelation first in the life of the people of Israel, then in the life, ministry, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and also in the life of the earliest church. Without assuming inerrancy as the foundation of the Bible's authority, faithful Christians must struggle over a lifetime to understand and apply the teachings of the Bible to their lives of faith. Thank you. Questions or comments? It was all so clear that nobody has any questions. Is that what it is? Since the Holy Spirit plays such an important role both in Calvin's thought and yours, would you be so kind to give us your understanding of what the Holy Spirit is? Of what the Holy Spirit is. Yes, as opposed to my inner subjective response or some voice that hovers at the edge of the universe. 
What is the Holy Spirit? What is the Holy Spirit? You're trying to find out if I'm a Stonite or a Campbellite, aren't you? <laughs> At least in part. Well, uh, for you know, I'm I'm uh, I'm a fairly Orthodox Trinitarian, um, and so that will give you some clues as to where I stand uh, with respect to who the Holy Spirit is. Uh, but I think that the the Holy Spirit, especially if we take our cue from Scripture, uh, really functions. And here again, that's the it's the functional question that I'm most interested in functions in the lives of believing people in a wide variety of ways. I mean, you, you look at uh, the stories of the Hebrew Bible, you know, even the craftsmen who built the tabernacle were inspired by the Spirit of God, according uh, to the writers of Scripture. Uh, the prophets inspired, that's what the word actually means, right? So for me, what the Spirit mainly does, and again, it's the functional question that I'm uh, focusing on and dodging the formal question, uh, is, what the Spirit does is work inwardly in the life of the believing person uh, to instruct, to, to, to purify, sanctify, to use a kind of Wesleyan term, mm -hmm. right, uh, the believing person, right? That's, that's my view. I, you know, I don't know if that directly answers your question. Uh, again, because I'm mainly focusing on the functional question and not the not the formal one. Is that helpful or? Well, it, it sounds like you're giving us a circular argument here. I think Calvin gives us a circular argument. And, and I, I'm trying <laughs> to think of another illustrious or maybe infamous uh, alumni of this institution, uh, Brother Jones. Ah, oh, yes. Uh, and how do we know that Jim's interpretation of the Spirit speaking to him? wasn't correct and yours is wrong, or vice versa. Right. It, it seems to me you've got a self-authenticating hermeneutic that is terribly subjectivistic. And uh, in a way, and I don't mean to make fun of it, but the Bible says, or, or, or means what I say it means, because, and why? Because the Holy Spirit tells me that's what it means. Mm -hmm. And that seems a little circular to me. Maybe many other people, it doesn't. Well, yeah, I mean, there is a certain circularity to it. And what we have to remember is, is that Calvin is, um, is operating within a certain systematic framework, right? Um, he's also operating within a particular historical framework, too. He's very concerned about, say, the radical reformers, who, whose major claim to fame, of course, in the 16th century was a belief in direct and immediate experience, inspiration by the Holy Spirit. He certainly doesn't want to go there. And in fact, partly his reflections on the authority of Scripture is, is an answer to those very Anabaptist kinds of claims. He wants to say, okay, yes, it's not Bible or Spirit, but it is both, right? And in some ways he's responding to Luther too, right? Because Luther was so insistent on the idea of sola scriptura that many second generation reformers, of which Calvin is of course one, um, responded that you know, it, the Bible in Luther's theology becomes dead letter, right? And, and so where's the vitality? Where's the, you know, where's the dynamism, right? So a second generation reformer like Calvin is going to try to put the two back together, saying it's not an either or, but it is in fact a both and. And that, I think, is what creates the kind of circularity that you're talking about. Calvin is not uh, um, immune to criticism here. I'm not suggesting that he is. But for me, it's at least one way of sort of solving the dilemma. How do we understand scriptural authority, right? And, and what he does, I think, uh, appropriately, is take, take the foundation of that authority out of the hands of human beings and place it back in the hands of God. Does that help? Yeah, I, yeah, I understand what your, your okay. position is. Right. I'm not saying I agree with it. That's, that's fine. fine. That's fine. Just open yourself to the spirit. It'll it'll come to you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> David. Um, if, if Calvin's position is that you can't apprehend the authority of Scripture until the Holy Spirit leads the way, basically. Can you be held accountable to living out the will of God 
for society that's revealed in Scripture before the Holy Spirit leads the way. So could you say, oh, boy. God, how do you leave it to justice? you to find the one hole in the argument? That's right. <laughs> how do you seek justice on a social level or say this yeah. is what we need to do? That's absolutely right. Remember, Calvin is operating within a kind of framework of, of at least a modest predestinarian uh, view. Certainly not the predestination, predestinarian views of the later Calvinists, whom I reject, right? Uh, but, uh, but he is operating within that basic framework. So there is a certain, well, you might even call it an elitism. There's a certain group of folk who's, who have this inward testimony of the Holy Spirit, who are more appropriate in their interpretations of Scripture, more, um, more open to that than, than others. Yeah, I think that's true. Yeah, yeah, it's hard to wiggle out of that elitism. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm curious, with your reading of Calvin on Scripture, what, do you, what then do you make of the early Christian writings that we have found since that aren't, that for whatever reason didn't make it into uh, the Bible as we know it? Mm -hmm. what, do you, what do you do with those? What do you do with those? Yeah, the, all of those extra canonical writings, you know. Uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls and and all of those uh, other Gospels. Anthony, you, you were ready to throw them out? Is that what that gesture meant? Get rid of them? Well, I'm not ready to go there. Toss them in. <laughs> I'm not ready to go there. Uh, and I'm not altogether comfortable with what I think is, is, is an idea that would be consistent with Calvin. Although I hear this all the time at the church I serve, the Presbyterian Church. Well, it's real easy. You know, you, all you got to do is make the assumption that uh, the Holy Spirit guided the process of canonization uh, and led the church into including those books that are appropriately Scripture, while you know eliminating the ones that didn't quite make the cut. I, I'm too much of a church historian to go there. You know, uh, I'm too aware of the political circumstances uh, that surrounded the process of canonization, the bloodshed that went along with it, uh, to to sort of accept that simplistic answer. But you've really pinpointed yet another difficulty. What do you do with those? Of course, most of that was outside of Calvin's purview in the 16th century, but it is a dilemma that we modern folk have to sort of, um, we have to adjudicate, uh, even if we're going to sort of claim to go back to Calvin's understanding of scriptural authority. Yeah, it's a good point. Great point. Yes, Haley. Biggest thing that you disagree with Calvin on? The biggest thing I disagree with Calvin on. Oh, wow, that's a good one. Um, and one I didn't expect. I think, yeah, and actually it's not as hard as I thought. <laughs> it, if, it, if it were up to me, there, there are sections of Book 4 that should be torn out of the institutes and uh, con consigned to the flames and never read again. Uh, and one of, those, one of those sections would be Calvin on civil government, okay? Uh, taking his cue directly from, uh, from the Book of Romans, Chapter 13, all uh, power has been put in place by God, and you know all of the theological ramifications of that. Uh, just not ready to go there. Um, but again, we have to think about Calvin as a 16th century writer too, understanding him in his context. But yeah, if it were up to me, we'd tear that part out. Good question. I expected that from someone who is who is so interested in revolution, right? I expect you would find that answer I, I rather satisfying. That answer. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> good. Other questions or observations? Hey. One of the things that's been asked repeatedly, and so I think it'd be interesting to have a variety of answers from the different presenters, from different people in the audience, has been what do you do with, or how do you understand, or where do you break from Calvin's understanding of predestination? It seems to be a popular question, so I'd love to hear your two cents. Yeah, yeah. It's a good question, and uh, I'm going to rely on uh, my terrible artwork here for just a moment, okay? This is at least the way I explained it in some of the courses that I teach. Uh, first of all, I want to preface this by saying predestination, you know, uh, it's buried in a section of Book 3 of the Institutes. You know, it's not Calvin's starting point for his systematic, and that's a very important point. Uh, and if you look historically, uh, you know, because the Institutes were written over a period of 25 years, 
right? So it went through different editions. And if you look historically, the section that Calvin writes on predestination was, was written, he wrote it shortly after the death of his infant son, right? So he's in the midst of this profound personal and pastoral crisis. So he's trying to make sense of what, you know, what do you do in, in a situation like that? And the fact is, is he just goes back to some of the early church fathers and in some ways parrots, uh, particularly uh, things like that Augustine said. Okay, so I want to preface that by saying, okay, there's, there's some things that we need to consider around his doctrine, right? Uh, and and uh, of course, Calvin, and certainly the later Calvinists, and here's where my uh, artwork is not so good, right? Okay, for Calvin and, uh, uh, and later Calvinists, it is very clear that the understanding of predestination op operates, and this is how I like to describe it, operates vertically, right? God has at some point, right, drawn a line, right? I don't know, which side do you want to be on? You can, okay, you guys can be the ones going to heaven, right, being saved. And the rest of you, sorry about your luck. Haley, I intentionally included you in that part, right? Okay. <laughs> But God has decided at some point, right, that this is the way it is. And, and later Calvinists in particular pick up on that very small notion in Calvin's own systematic and make it their systematic starting point, right? So later really conservative Calvinists will say, well, since we know that God has operated this way, well, we can completely discount the experience, the, the, the intelligence and uh, of more than half of humanity because they're just, they're not the elect. They're not among the elect. And that means that those of us who are, are really pretty special, right? And that's the systematic starting point for many of those Calvinist theologians. Right? And it's, it's absolutely central. It becomes the lens through which they understand almost everything about the way God operates. And that for me is deeply problematic. And, and if it's not Calvin on civil government, it would be this one that I would want to reject. Okay? Now, <clears throat> if you'll forgive me for just a moment, I'm going to talk a little bit about Karl Barth, right? whom I think does a pretty decent job, although it's not without its flaws, of revisioning, recasting this notion of predestination. For, for Carl, God's predestination operates horizontally, right? I mean, that's another way of thinking about it. He doesn't use that word. But there are certain attributes of all human beings that God affirms, rejoices in. And there are certain attributes of all of us that God condemns that is outside of the will of God. Now you may say, hold on a minute, that turns Karl Barth into a universalist, does it not? Well, there are lots of people who follow Barth in that direction, okay? Others who don't. But I think this is one way of solving that dilemma, right? And it goes back to a notion that even Luther talks about. We are all simul justus et peccator, all simultaneously sinners and yet justified, saved, right? And so I think that's a helpful way of thinking about it. This is not Calvin. This is not the Calvinists. These are later uh, theologians who develop Calvin's theology in very distinctive ways in different contexts. Does that help? We also shift to Jesus, of course, being part and always goes back to Jesus. Always goes back to Jesus, that's right. Uh, Jesus is the elect, and then we are taught to respond to that. Very, very well put. That's exactly right. Michael? Um, I, I, I just have one problem with the move you made is that Bart is not Calvin, and neither is he a Calvinist. That, well, so he's not a solution to Calvin. He's, he's not a solution to Calvin, but he stands squarely in the Reformed tradition. Oh, for sure. Okay. With, 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 with and, and going further with Bart, I mean, Bart is clear that God's first and last word is yes. Yes. Which is so alien to Calvin. Yes, ab absolutely right. I, I think that's, that's very helpful, Michael, and I appreciate your reminding us of that. And that's exactly why, you know, many interpreters of Bart take it clearly in the direction of u universal salvation. Well, he, he hedges on there. He surely does. So, am I? Oh. Well, 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 <laughs> you decide, basically, is what he says. Right? Good. Does that help? Okay. Other questions or observations? Anthony. I think in, in the spirit of this lecture series on Calvin, um, 
a question about who's Calvin and the historiography behind how Calvin is perceived, understood, misunderstood. Um, one of the best pieces that I've read on Calvin in recent years uh, was an article, actually it was a chapter in a book by Marilyn Robinson mm. called uh, Death of Adam. And it was very interesting because she had come to reading Calvin uh, after she talked about the movie Dick, and that prompted of all things. Yes, uh, <laughs> Melville's uh, right. understanding of proclivities toward Calvin or Calvin. And so she went to him, she went to Calvin, Calvin's writing, and started reading. And I have this quote here, which I thought was a great quote. She says that um, I was astonished to realize how utterly different Calvin is from anything I had ever heard or read about him. It was really moving to discover such, and I quote, able to part of the book too, a vast and lucid and gracious spirit, unquote. And it's, it's, uh, it's interesting to me how, in part of her critique it was that, um, what she understands to be the, the historiography yes. being behind why he's perceived what he is, is, is partly out of bad translations made into English and other languages. That's right. Whether the predestination, uh, portion or other portions that crafted this image of Calvin and people, even some of the great historians of the 19th and 20th century have cast him in this figure and people just rehashed it. That's right. Um, what do you see as, I'm not sure if you know, it's, a, it's a remedy or if obviously just read it, right? And read it. <laughs> um, Don't read about it, read it. read about it, yeah. What, what implications do you see beyond you know, that conversation? Um, what would you have to say yeah. in terms of that? How would we rehabilitate, rehabilitate Calvin? Perhaps. Calvin's yeah. image? Well, uh, again, uh, you know, I don't, I don't want to be trite here, but I think one of the most important things we can do is read Calvin, right? It, read what he says, and this vast and generous spirit, I'm sorry I didn't get all the adjectives yeah. you talked about, you know, comes shining through on virtually every page. Sure, there are those passages that are very troublesome, uh, predestination and civil government and all that sort of stuff. But when it comes to talking about the character of God, when it comes to talking about God's relationship with humanity, uh, when it comes to talking about how God has been in and continues to be in relationship with the Jewish people, you know, Calvin, Calvin's understanding is vast and broad and gracious in so many ways. And so I think going back to read him, rather than read what others have said about him is really a critical, critical step in the right direction, it seems to me. Um, it's funny that you should mention that because ordinarily when uh, I t want to start talking about Calvin in the survey course that I teach, uh, usually the first thing that I say is, okay, I'm going to say the word, John, the name John Calvin and what images come to your mind? Almost every time the first word out of people's mouths is predestination, almost always and sort of bleak cruelty, a control freak, right? Uh, the one, and if anybody knows anything beyond that, they know, well, he's the one who executed Servetus for denying the doctrine of the, well, that's not true at all, <laughs> right? He was part of the decision, but you know, it wasn't he who went out and hung him, although that's, that's the impression that many people, many people are left with. And I think part of the reason is, is because we see, and, and let me be just, probably slightly judgmental here for just a minute. Um, and that, that is to say, I think that you know, Calvin, particularly in the US context, has been interpreted through the lens of uh, fundamentalist Christians. You know, Calvin, Calvinists, Calvinism tends to be associated with the kind of closed off, uh, blindly obedient kinds of faith that is just simply not who Calvin is at all, you know? Doesn't that get tied up into like, the Puritan identity? Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's like just lumping. That's right. That's right. New England Puritanism is actually my academic specialty. I mean, that's, that's, I've spent lots of time with those New England Puritans, and I love to hate those Puritans. You know, they're just fascinating people in so many ways. Uh, but here again, even the historiography is beginning to change there, too. I'm thinking particularly, well, it's an older book now, uh, but a woman by the name of Janice Knight, uh, 
uh, wrote a book probably 10 or 15 years ago called Orthodoxies, plural, in Massachusetts, where she argues, uh, and quite forcefully and, and helpfully it seems to me, that in fact, you know, the kind of bleak and cruel Calvinism that we typically associate with those dour, fun-hating Puritans is actually only one strain. Sure, there, there were those people who were like that, but there was, a, there was a different strain of orthodoxy altogether that was, that was about celebrating the grace of God and the freedom uh, that believers have because of their faith in Jesus Christ. And it is a freeing understanding of, of the life of faith, not a sort of dour, rule-following uh, existence. You, you see what I'm saying? And, and she argues that really to say, to say one without the other is a caricature of New England Puritans. We need to get at least both of that, if not an even more broad and varied complex picture. So even in our own history as a nation, um, you know, those Puritans are held in such poor regard by us progressive liberals, you know, who are all about pluralism and, and you know, inclusivity and all of that. Um, it's, it's a caricature. It's a caricature. It's like the ones who made the loudest noise were the ones that were remembered most. Exactly. That's exactly right. I don't want to sound like anti Calvinist here. It's okay. There's plenty of them. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's just, I mean, I've, I've read Calvin. Mm. And I mean, just taking off this issue of predestination, I think you'd agree that for Calvin, it's, it's not simply the, the strict principle of who is consigned to heaven and hell. But there's an understanding about how to, well, how he characterizes what happens in the life of the believer. Yes. And, and that, for me, is, is troubling. Um, and there's a kind of, he, he recommends a kind of, well, a, a, an acceptance of evil, oppression, as coming ultimately from God whoever it is channeled through on the earth. He, he says that in, in a number of places, not, not in a corner, in a number mm -hmm. of places, would you agree? Yeah, there are passages in Calvin that are like that. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not going to deny that. Uh, but here again, it's a question of emphasis. Are you going to paint a picture or a portrait of Calvin right. that focuses only on that narrowness? Or are you going to paint a more balanced picture? I've erred in the other direction, and I admit that. And right. I'm trying to get you to include I hear you. These really gruesome pieces. I, I had 20 minutes, Michael. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but no, no, I, I, again, I don't want to make light of your point because it is a very important one. Um, but again, a more, uh, a more judicious portrait of Calvin, I think, is, is really in order. Yeah. Scott, of, of all the issues uh, facing the contemporary church, where do you see Calvin being the, of the most use? Oh boy, that's a good question. That's a good question. I think, uh, and this will take us outside of the institutes, I think uh, that Calvin is of most use in the openness that he, um, that he expresses in terms of uh, uh, innovations in worship. Right? I mean, because certainly one of the issues that the contemporary church is facing is, you know, you know transforming, reforming its, its worst life of worship. And Calvin was, you know, on the cutting edge of that in 16th century Geneva. I mean, th these were wonderfully freeing ways uh, uh, to worship. Uh, they, were, they, they took very seriously the average layperson's capacity to understand. That's what the Psalter is all about, right? You can learn and sing scripture for crying out loud, right? And that's, that's revolutionary in that context. And so I think if we sort of look broadly at the kinds of things Calvin did to implement the reforming ideas that he had, there's some really helpful things uh, that we can recover. Yeah, great question. We all are full of good questions tonight. Well, I think his Isaiah commentary, too, shows how the church can be more social justice-minded mm -hmm. and human rights. Excellent. Yeah, I mean, let, let's face it. Calvin has written commentaries on almost every book of the Bible, including, uh, including those 8th eighth, eighth century prophets. So how in the world can he not focus on those themes if he's, if he's writing a commentary? That's exactly right.
It's just that we don't focus on those very much. Very good point. You know, and, and uh, Carol Johnston in the very first lecture talked about how uh, freeing Calvin can be for women, for example, and that was rather revolutionary in the 16th century. She draws, dink, uh, uh, drinks deeply from Calvin's well in her understanding of environmental ethics. I mean, there's, there's a richness here that can, be, that can be tapped into for the contemporary setting. Nick? It seems to be the case, and not knowing, not having written Calvin, I don't know. We can change that. <laughs> I, I assume you want to. Yeah, we can do that. Not knowing where Calvin stops and the Calvinists you speak of uh, start, it has been the case that at least in some of the loudest interpreters of Calvin have often been, in some way or another, supersessionist, oh, yeah. anti-Semitic in some way. And that being a deep interest of places like CTS to build considerable and valuable relationships with the Jewish community, I wondered how you would respond to that. Is that in Calvin? Is that not in Calvin? How does Calvin deal with that? Do you yes. break, where do you break from him or whatever? Yeah, yeah. Well, Calvin, like most, um, most 16th century reformers, uh, <clears throat> learned to read Hebrew from the local Jewish community, right? I mean, so there had to be a relationship there, a, a, at least some level of respect. Uh, because, you know, going back to the original languages of, of, the script, of the scriptures was extremely important for those reformers. So they had to learn it somewhere. This is certainly true of Luther, his 1546 treatise, treatise on the Jews notwithstanding. Um, and Calvin's, Calvin's the same way. Uh, there, there is a kind of supersessionism that can be discerned in Calvin if read in a certain direction. I mean, Calvin's institutes very clearly Christocentric. Right? Everything that happened before the coming of Christ points us to Christ. That includes God's relationship with the people of Israel. It was all preparation for the coming of Jesus. Right? And everything that comes afterwards points us back to Christ. So very Christocentric. And I think that's one of the ways in which modern interpreters of Calvin need to, need to work on that. Notice that in, in that closing quote, uh, where I sort of define in my own terms what the Bible is and what its authority is, it's an indispensable witness to God's self-revelation first in the life of the people of Israel. Not first in the, in the life of the people of Israel so that we can understand Christ better. That's a clearly supersessionist way of looking at it. But to treat God's activity in the life of the people of Israel as God's self-disclosure of its own right, I think that's really important. And ongoing self-revelation in the life of the people of Israel. Uh, in fact, I think uh, Calvin helps us see that by saying things that Calvin wouldn't say, right? I mean, his Christocentrism draws into high relief the need for a revision of that. Does that make sense? So that's what I would urge us to do. Now, if Clark Williamson were here, he'd probably, you know, want to disagree with me, but that's okay want to do things differently. Yeah. Just with fear and trembling that I'm going to ask this question, but um, what, I guess, the, the easy one would be the instances, but what reading would you suggest, for, are you suggesting to actually read Calvin, right? So right. he didn't sleep much, so he, but he wrote a lot, so. <laughs> um, Institutes? Well, you know, if you, don't want, if you don't want to read the Institutes, although I would certainly recommend I, it. Yeah, I'm a Presbyterian. Uh, there you go. Seminary, so I, I was forced to. You got the whole thing, right? You swallowed it wholesale. Some of it. Right, right. Well, you know, many years ago there was published, and in fact it's still in print, um, a book called uh, A Reformation Debate. Uh, and it was a letter uh, written by Jacopo Sadaletto, who was a, a Roman Catholic theologian, who wrote to the Genevans and said, you know, you know, all these innovations that the reformers are teaching, you know, you're in real trouble if you, if you keep go down this road, right? And Calvin's reply to Sadaletto is really helpful because in a very short piece, in a very short work, he really gets to the heart of what his theological system is all about, his understanding particularly of justification, how people are saved. And if you want a quick entry into Calvin, I'd suggest reading his reply to Sadaletto. Uh, it's very helpful. I should have read it. it was, I, once you said it, I 
came back. Ah, it was on the syllabus. You just didn't yes. read. It? Okay, got it. Uh, <laughs> it's quite all right. I, I, it's, yeah. It helps. Yeah. Yeah. Scott, since you mentioned uh, Bart before, would, would, would you say that, that Bart was a little bit more supersessionist than Calvin? Um, because he goes as far as to say that Israel is so late in the church, it's sort of absorbed into the church. I don't remember Calvin saying that. Can you yeah. recall that Calvin went that far? No, I don't think so. I'd have to, I'd have to dig to be certain on that, but I don't think so. I think Bart really takes Calvin, or Bart's form is, is of, of supersessionism is much, much stronger. I think you're right. Anything else? Well, thank you very much for all of these very good questions. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Uh, like I